right, so we finally went live, and we're good, and I'm still working on my transitions. They'll be better next week. I swear they will be. Welcome, everybody, to Love City Live. We've got viewers over on Love City Arts Collective Facebook page. We've got viewers over on my private page. They're over on the Love City YouTube page. They're also on Twitter, Twitch, and Periscope. So thanks, everybody, for uh, kicking in. We've got our first comment. Julie Razor, is that how you pronounce it? Julie waves hello, Ash. Your hair looks so cute. I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit so I can hear you. Welcome everybody to Love City Live, the Good Report. I'm Andre in the flow. Tonight we're joined by Ash Van Otterloo and also Daniel Tidwell Davis. Where are you guys uh, coming in from? We are coming from the very same city. Actually, we're both yeah. from Bremerton, Washington, um, where it's weirdly, weirdly hot outside right now. Uh -huh. too hot outside right now <laughs> so we've built ourselves little air unit mazes in our house to have to try to go around i love it i love to see it i love to see it can you see yay friends uh, daniel you know cammy from the won't you be my neighbor group um yeah this is gonna be lots and lots of fun i'm gonna um continue to balance out a little bit of my sound so i can hear Matthew, oh, Cousin Matthew is here today. This is great. Okay, cool. So I want everybody um, to know exactly what we're trying to pull off here. What we're trying to pull off is this little thing called The Good Report. It's also called Love City Live. It is a gathering once a week of intentional spaces. Matthew Belinkus is, as you can see is an intentional space where we can take an inventory of what we're grateful for. Um, and instead of just doing that by myself, like I did in season two, I've decided to bring a few cool friends along, people that are within the Love City ecosystem, um, within the Love City network, people who I personally admire, who I just want to show off uh, with for and beside <laughs> um, for an hour and a half on a random Wednesday night. So today is the 9th of September. Um, we will never pass this way again. And that's kind of what I want to settle into. If you'll give me a good five to seven minutes, viewers, I see you've got about 12 people scattered across the universe. And that's important because all you need is one additional person to actually leak energy with you and you can actually move a lot of mountains um we've got 12 not even including us so 15 people have gathered around the planet um those are my auto will tell you through like every five minutes i think about how great we are and you're just gonna live with it and if you want to see something else viewers um and listeners just make a comment. Oh, it's a sound distorted. So how distorted is distorted? Work with me, Matthew. Is it distorted to you all? It's a little bit. It's distorted. Okay. You can tell me. Not too much. Just a little bit. My audio is distorted or just the overall sound altogether is distorted. I think just your mic. I'm hot. What about now? That's great. Yeah. Okay. There was, I oh was no, that's perfect. Edge, but that's. Thanks for telling me. I can't hear. I can't hear. I don't have a fancy setup where I can hear everything. Matthew, let me know by commenting if that's better. And thank you for. <laughs> it's drive through speaker box. Okay, one second. That's funny. I love it. I love it. One second. We can we can keep playing with it. What about now? Is that better? Can y'all hear me? If y'all can hear me, then I can hear me. Oh, great. Cool. Matthew, let us know, along with everyone that's watching, if you can hear me or not. And I'm going to take off one little headphone so I can hear myself a little better and not have to yell in the house. It's still distorted on that end. You know what? One second. Dora Lee is 
I think you should show everyone Dora Lee. Yes. Yeah, yes. while we're doing this little yeah. technical break, show off so, the, the puppy. This is Dora Lee. She is a great climber. Oh, Daniel, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dora Lee, and she uh, is a great Weimar puppy. She's about 14 weeks old, and she she's so uh, kind of like half great white shark. Um, <laughs> all just chewing right now, but she's sweet. <laughs> she is sweet. She'll be sweeter when she falls asleep. Yeah. <laughs> She's so floppy. The other day I went to go, Daniel is my brother. And so I went to his house to see Dora Lee and she got so excited to see us that she just came like racing. She just came racing across the yard, but like she doesn't have brakes yet. So <laughs> like her front leg stopped and her back legs didn't. And she just kind of went like cartwheeling across the yard. It didn't bother her. She just got up and she was like, it's cool. Nothing happened. Rubber. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really cute. Uh oh, Andre froze up a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, I see Cammy. It is Dora Lee, the first one. Um, she's named after Dolly Parton's character in Nine to Five, so that's the spelling we use. <laughs> it's a good name. I like it. I wonder, can everyone hear a little better? Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you. Your but your yeah, video see. froze on us. Yeah, but your audio oh. is perfect. Okay. Um, well, you know, you gotta kind of, let's see, let's see what happens if I, if I do that. I may have lost everything when I, um, tried to correct this on the fly. So let, let's see. Okay. Audio is much better, says Julie. Okay. So we're, we're working towards a, a peaceful yeah, yeah. place. Um, all three of y'all are better now, says Alejandra. You just can't see me, okay. and that's okay. Hey, Alejandra. I'm gonna, I'm going to Alejandra. try. Oh, I know what I did. When I unplugged the microphone, in order to, um, <laughs> everyone it's wants just, to We're just me. building suspense. Yeah. If We're you see me jump, system. it's because the dog is biting my side. <laughs> <laughs> my dog is locked downstairs right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's very vocal. She, she sounds like a hippopotamus. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know why that's what my brain went to, because I've never actually heard one of those. Right? <laughs> a gator. She sounds like a gator. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she heard you and decided to keep like vocalizing. She did. She was like, "Yes, I do. Listen to it. This is excellent." Go over there. <laughs> yes, my spouse is downstairs. He's still working, so nice. I am on puppy duty. Yes. You know, I find that pets and videos in zoom calls are making them a lot more livable for me it's true just bring in a little snake or a little puppy and uh -huh. it goes a little bit better no dead space because they're biting you in the side like a shark exactly <laughs> yeah you might need band-aids but no one got bored <laughs> yeah i'm not sure if you all can still hear or not. i can hear you now i can oh. hear you now but then you went away Okay, so hold on. There you are. We can hear you again. <laughs> oh, no. That sounded like auto-tune. Ooh. We could, like, auto-tune everything we say. We could auto-tune Dora dead. Lee and see if it sounds like anything. Yes. Can y'all... You still can't hear me. We can hear you now. We can hear you now, yeah. 
You can hear me. Okay, so I'll just I'll do this in a bit of a vacuum until I can fi fix the technical. I'm so okay. glad that cousin Matthew told me um, that we were all distorted because these are things I can't hear when I'm kind of operating in a vacuum by myself. I've worked on this for about five hours today. I know you can tell, and and now it's it we're not. It's just not. It's just not playing along, um, and that's okay. Um, because we've got Ash and we've got Daniel. And what I was actually going to do, if everyone can still hear me, um, we were on the way to pulling ourselves into the present moment mm -hmm. of 20 minutes past the top of the hour. Um, a lot of this has been dedicated to trying to get the cobwebs worked out of the machine. But um, I really still want to even if you can't see me, but you can hear me, and I'll, I'll... until it gets better. I want people, wherever they are, to just anchor themselves on the floor, feet on the floor. Um, and we're just going to take a breath, and I'm going to start shuffling these angel deck cards, even though you can't see me still. <laughs> um, and this will be the word that we'll use for this good report and this episode with Ash and Daniel to kind of ground our work and our time here together. And so coming into 21 minutes past top of the hour we vow to not give up on the projects that bring us joy mm. how easy is it for us to have a frozen face on the screen mm. and to say you know what fuck it <laughs> screw this <laughs> I don't want to be seen and I don't want to show up in these ways. And yet here we are. Um, and what I love about presence and not presence with a lowercase P, but presence with a capital P. What I love about presence um, is that it is instantaneously available to us. And so wherever you are today, I want to invite you to just add chords into this. Bring yourself into 23 minutes past the hour. Nowhere to be. Nowhere to be. Nowhere to be. Just press them. And so I'm just going to shut down all of my screens that are here, and I'm just going to abide with you all. What we find is that if we just stay close to ourselves, if we just stay close to ourselves, we'll always land exactly where we're supposed to be. Take a breath. I picked up the cards to reshuffle and the one that was sitting on top before I even went to reshuffle was responsibility. Mm -hmm. 
David says, go green. Uh, I guess that's the green screen you saw. Um, and then Cammy says, we can see you. I can see you too. Okay, so the word we're picking tonight is responsibility. And what the book says, the ability to respond to life as a series of personal decisions. Staying accountable for your actions strengthens your freedom to choose and build self-respect. And I say this as I'm on a completely different video camera and a completely different audio setup than I was when we started 25 minutes ago. The ability to respond to life as a series of personal decisions. Staying accountable for your actions strengthens your freedom to choose and builds self-respect. What are you choosing tonight, viewers? What are you responsible for? Who are you responsible for? What and who are you responsible to? We'll just breathe on that for a second. I always have to ask myself, do you set out on Wednesday night to build a version of Cirque du Soleil? Or do you just want to abide with friends and hold space? And I think the deepest part of me, there's a part of me that wants the shine and the, and that like the universe has been preventing me for now two weeks from getting my full, and I'm not going to stop in this motherfucker until I get my full song and dance. But in the meantime, in between time, how are we going to be responsible for these moment-to-moment -moment decisions? So I want to thank you for watching tonight. I want to thank you for coming around this watering hole and sitting on your Muffet and your Tuffet and being here with Ash and Daniel and myself. Ash Van Otterloo is someone who I've known for way too fucking long. It's probably been a couple of uh, decades if we're honest with ourselves and with each other. <laughs> It's true. How is I, that true? Time just keeps moving forward, you know? <laughs> it's good, though. With or without you, it just keeps moving forward. And you've got actual kids to show for it. Yeah. And I've, and I've got a couple creative project children <laughs> children yes. to show for it. Yes. Um. And tonight, what we've gathered to talk about and to um, be present to is your creative baby. Yeah. What is your creative baby and why did you put it out into the world? Well, my, my current creative baby, the one that just got born, and that's funny that you say that because right before it came out, and right before I start any new project, I have dreams of finding babies that just like baby dreams or baby things. Like I find them or I'm giving birth to things unexpectedly. It really is like that. Like I think that brain children, they're, they are children <laughs> and they have tantrums sometimes. <laughs> uh, but the current one is a book called Caddy Wampus, uh, which I'm so excited about. Um, I set out to write this book because somebody asked, like, um, why are there never any books about, like, rural, like, rural witches, right? Like, people who come from places where, like, I don't what know. What kind of all, witches? Like, like, 
in, out in the sticks. You know what I mean? Rural like, witches. Rural witches. Yeah, like people who don't people who don't have necessarily like a lot of funds, or people who don't live in London. <laughs> or, Wait, are are are, are are witches not to, to pause your your opening here? No, but no, are, no. are witches usually affluent? I I think that I think that popular witch books tend to be written by like okay like if you think of the Harry Potter. Uh, like the Harry Potter series, like he starts out not having much, but I mean, they in the end he has like a vault full of gold, and he lives in a castle and unlimited resource, and you know, like the the world is kind of his oyster. And I was thinking, like, wow, so that's the fantasy, right? But like, how how can I write a book in in the witch trope, which to me is about agency, right? It's about like, what can I do with what I have? to affect something that that looks like magic in the world. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. Um so to me like that that would be the the heart of the witch trope. I was thinking, well, I would love to see I would love to see stories about witches who who don't necessarily have everything handed to them. Um because you know, my experience growing up is I I didn't necessarily I am I'm non-binary queer person. And I didn't necessarily have a lot of people saying like, this is how to be you. This is, this is how you do it. Um, here are your robes. I'm going to sort you into a house. <laughs> Not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there weren't, there wasn't an instruction book. So I was thinking, you know, like a lot of people have the experience of not necessarily having a ton of resource or having to sort of figure out their own magic and it goes badly for a long time before they get it right you know it's like a it's like a journey of trying to figure yourself out as opposed to a journey of trying to like be the chosen one if that makes sense it does it does can we pause yeah. there for a second and talk about yeah. your your journey of coming to yourself because i didn't even know that you were yeah. queer identified until this moment yeah oh seriously <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i don't look i don't i don't assume these things in the year You're of our right. Lord 2020 like you right. know <laughs> right no it's fair it's totally fair um yeah so i think that <laughs> i think sometimes when you grow up in an environment that doesn't necessarily help you identify yourself and say oh those feelings that you're feeling that's what that means <laughs> like there are words for that there's there are ways to there are like avenues for that like i just knew that when i watched i just knew then why when i watched robin hood i didn't know if i wanted to be robin or maid marion i didn't know if i wanted to be with robin or maid marion you know what i mean like it was Mm. very confusing for me and so like i had even a hard time picking apart like being attracted to someone as a role model and being attracted to someone like attracted to them right i had no idea how to tease that apart um and so it was probably 24 i guess before i realized yeah i'm I'm definitely like pansexual that's me (laughs) like these uh it's probably not normal to feel like not not normal but it's probably not straight to to feel like oh like i kind of wish that that I could kiss this person that I'm friends with, right? Like, so that was- oh, Wait, do, I, wait, 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 wait. Do, do you want to kiss all of your friends? Definitely not. <laughs> Absolutely <Okay>. not. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. Just, 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 just making sure that we're on the same page here. But when I, but when I came out to my friends, like so many people are like, wait, but you're not attracted to me, right? And I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, and some of them I just asked them yourself. and said yes. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, and so it took me a little bit. It took me a little bit longer to realize that non-binary is what I felt about my gender, um, mm. because I had. Uh, is it okay if I just speak like really openly? Because I don't mind being like super candid. Like I, I dealt Holy with sense. a lot of like eating disorder, um, and physical dysphoria had a lot of um, self-harming tendencies um, and in a lot of, and it all revolved around just feeling like I was, I was looking in the mirror or looking at pictures of myself and not recognizing who I saw. It was very weird. I was like, why does this not sit right with me? Why can't I get good with this? Um, You're talking and, about like the long haired, like girlified version of yourself. Sure. 
But yes, but even when people, like, even if people would talk to me and say, hey, yes, yes, ma'am, let me help you, ma'am, or miss, can I help you? Like, something in me was just like, oh, I, I, I feel mad at you, <laughs> and I don't know why I feel mad at you, but it's upsetting to me. Like, it's actually upsetting, so I would go home and, like, try to figure out who I was all over again. Um, yeah, and if you don't, if you don't have language around like gender and gender expression, if you weren't raised with it and you're having to kind of like piecemeal it together, homemade style, right. Mm -hmm. To try to understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be like kind of a long and kind of wacky journey. You know what I mean? To I do. I do. Um, I want to pivot, um, to, because these are siblings, everyone. And I want to thank yeah. everybody who's watching right now on all the Facebook spaces and YouTube and <laughs> Twitch and Periscope and all those spaces. We finally got a community. Well, we had a community and then my technical malfunctions lost all the community and now everyone's coming back. Um, we've got <laughs> siblings tonight. We've got Ashman Otterloo of Caddy Wampus, the scholastic published book. That's amazing. And then we've got Daniel Tidwell Davis, who's like a spiritual guru to a lot of Love City projects and also like walks the world as a personal uh, fountain of, of spirit to me. So you all come from similar backgrounds and Ash is talking, not similar backgrounds, the same fucking background. Yeah. <laughs> and Ash is talking to me about like not having role models that actually could show. What are your yeah. pronouns, Ash? They, them. Yeah. That could show them the path forward. You end up being queer as well from the mm -hmm. same house. What was your vantage point on that coming from, from like through your lens? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, not dissimilar. Like we, we grew up in a very religious, uh, deep South white family, right? <laughs> uh, suburbia, you know, kind of rural and suburbia. Um, and there just was either, like, in, in most cases, there was no language or a vacuum of language around uh, gender expression and queer identity. Um, and then in places where there wasn't a vacuum, there was just sort of outright condemnation, yeah. um, both in terms of, like, religious and worldview and all kinds of things. And so, yeah, growing up, like... It's interesting because we we're really close in age. We're like less than two years apart, um, yeah. and it's just the two of us. And uh, and so, growing up, like we were fairly close, um, and we've always been fairly close. Uh, we fought a little bit, like you know, around yeah. like around the age of like Caddy Wampus's target audience. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I think I think we had. Uh, the other big part of our, our story is we were uh, homeschooled. And so it was very, like, cloistered <laughs> in this world, right? So each yeah. other was, like, a, a, a sense of strength. And I remember being a kid um, when I was about, like, five. Uh, and I had, like, no friends, basically. And Ash would, like, at least <laughs> once a week would get a ball cap and like <laughs> dress insane. up like a boy and come climb through my window and pretend to be this like friend. I forget the name you use. Oh, it was Eric. Eric. I remember. Yeah. It was yeah. Whole yeah. Persona. Okay. Back up, back up, back up, back <laughs> yeah. up. Because this is, this is something that's both sweet and endearing and kind, but also lightweight weird. Okay. So you, totally. would, so <laughs> you would know that Daniel was feeling lonely in his yep. boydom. And you yep. would put on a hat and climb yep. outside the house through the Absolutely. window. Yep. Uh -huh. Pretending to be Eric. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and what would Eric it... what would Eric do and say? Oh my God. I think Eric just really wanted to be super cool. Yeah. You know what Very I mean? Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> What's up, dude? How's it going, I, man? Eric was way more butch than I was. <laughs> But Eric was your was your at the time your identified sister, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is so uh -huh. interesting. I love it. I love uh -huh. it. Keep going. Keep uh -huh. going. So Eric would come over and like kick it. And what did you discover with Eric? I think that I discovered like I needed to have ball caps in my life. It was necessary. It was like needed and necessary. Partially because I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause you too. I'm on the ball cap. Uh, Phil Lashawn Booknight is saying, Oh my god, so cute. Um, <laughs> oh, love you, no. with Eric. Oh, and no, then, no. 
<laughs> Bill went to undergrad with us. Um, and then Cammy's saying, I would read that book and watch that movie. So, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. So the, what about the baseball cap really like spoke to you? I think it's because I wasn't like, I wasn't really allowed to cut my hair or I don't know that I wasn't allowed to as much as like my parents would, my mother would probably have cried for hours if I had just gone in the bathroom and did it. Right. Like that would have ruined someone's life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) so my hair had the power to ruin lives. That's pretty powerful. (laughs) Yeah. Right. But I could put it up. So if it was like up in the ball cap, like I, I could not have it. Right. And right. also, it was like this permission. It was a permission to not be cute, mm-hmm. right? Permi- can be... we pa- can we pause there for a second? Um, and I hope that you can track because I pause from time to time. No, absolutely. Um, a permission to not be cute. Yep. A permission to not be cute. Yep. <laughs> because how many of us? are wrestling all the fucking time with the need to be cute. Right. And sometimes we don't want to be cute. No. Sometimes it feels bad. Like, sometimes it feels like there are things that you need to say and get off your chest and put into the world. You know, like, even, even like, vision-wise and energetically, there are things that, that it's hard to put into the world for some people, at least for me, if I'm required to do it and be cute at the same time, right? It's mm-hmm. like, well, do that, but don't have teeth when you do it, right? Or do that, but don't don't be threatening in any way. Don't be powerful. Like, be make me feel good about me, right? Like, <laughs> well, make Je- me. Yeah, Jennifer's saying, Ash, thank you for sharing that part of your experience. I really appreciate you allowing mm-hmm. us to have a greater understanding of non-binary. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Julie also says this is such a sweetness. <laughs> Julie is sweetness. If it's Julie Reeser, <laughs> I love her. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And so, yeah, there's this there's this pressure that we're all put under. Um, I want to pivot back to Daniel for a second and talk yeah. about, like, okay, so you are, were you always a holy roller? Oh, yeah. Oh. I mean, we were, like, born into, you know, the Pentecostal. <laughs> world could you talk um could you talk to a person i mean i know that phil will understand cammy perhaps (laughs) will understand could you give us a little glimpse into that fucking cult well yeah i mean you know it's from like growing up not only were we pentecostal but also like our parents were like doing ministry stuff and so we were in church no less than five times a week yeah at least like like that was the bare minimum right and it would be like on sunday that was like from like 8 a.m till about 8 p.m like we'd be at church that whole time we'd just eat lunch at church and all those things um and so we just that was that was life right like um and in that you know in the pentecostal flavor of um of Christianity, like we were trying to get Baptists saved. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was, it's real extreme. And like, there's some beautiful things in terms of the, um, the high priority on both music and embodiment um, that are really lovely. Um, and then there's some really like kind of creepy, gross things as well. A lot of like sense of um, anything that's not understood, especially things around mental health, um, around difference, out, anything that's outside the community is often put into spiritualized terms as de- like demonic or evil or those sorts of things, right? Like, and so it's like what is known is good, and what is not known or not familiar then has to be vilified and what that ends up doing then is like for me as a queer kid growing up like i knew from the time i was probably like eight or nine that 
being gay meant I was going to go to hell in that system. To right? hell? Yeah. And I love you said that in that system. Yeah, yeah. In, I mean, in, in, in that in that right. universe, in exactly. that corner yeah, of the great yeah. big uh, uh-huh. universe. In that belief system and that way of understanding the world, that's what that meant. And so for me as a kid, because that's the language I learned to speak, like literally my native language is as much Pentecostalism as it is English, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I had to learn other languages and other systems of belief before I was able to get free enough to say like, hey, this isn't some like awful thing that I have to fight, but this is like part of my belovedness as a human being. Yeah. Mm, Could you tell me about the other systems of belief that have helped get you free? Because there may be people who will pass by this, and you don't have to give us the whole thing because I know that sure. healing happens over time. And if, if I had to stop and name everything that helped me get out of the bullshit, we'd be here until mm-hmm. like next week. Mm-hmm. Um, but what were some of the other systems that you picked up in exchange for that Pentecostalism for anybody who's listening, who may feel a little bit stuck? Yeah. yeah. So for me, you know, like I, um, because like the Christian language was always what I grew up with. Like it's the genetic lottery landed me in a Christian family and that's where I was born instead of a Hindu family or a Sikh yep. family or a Buddhist family. Right. And right. so and, and I'm sorry, I'm not to interrupt you, but like, I would have loved that, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, that's what I'm working with, right? And so when I began to expand my horizons and, like, the Pentecostalism in America, like, basically folks think that, like, Jesus was here on Earth about 2,000 years ago and then in about 1900, Pentecostalism happened and nothing happened in between. Um, and the reality is, is that there are as many flavors of Christianity, <laughs> like as there are areas of the world, um, and more, right? And so that's just one faith system. And then when you begin to look at multiple faith systems, um, and begin to explore biology and ecology <laughs> and physics, and you begin to say like. Oh, there are many ways to understand our connectedness to one another and to the universe. Beyond um, beyond what Phil is saying here, to burn in the lake of fire for eternity. Like that that isn't our yeah. only approach to this. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. Well, and even even to know that like what most Western Christians believe about hell has more to do with Dante than it does with even Christian or Hebrew scriptures. Dante, like, you mean like the coal hell like, guy? The cold hell yeah, guy? Yeah, I mean, so you've got like, you know, you've got like Dante's Inferno and all of that, you know, like like most of our visions of, that we have, like what, what Jewish and script, Christian scriptures refer to as like Sheol and Gehenna and these different places, like it's not like hell, a physical place that people go for all eternity, it's like, no, like, Gehenna and Megiddo, these are, like, places where we go and burn our trash. <laughs> right? Ooh, <laughs> and it's okay. like saying, like, we're going to kick you outside the city where we burn our trash. Right. Like, it's a metaphor. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> and so, and so, like, just beginning to understand that, like, oh, even in the broader, like, Christian traditions, there's so many different ways to think about this. And then coming to recognize, like... And it tends to be that across religions, fundamentalism within the religion has more to like in common with fundamentalism in other religions than it does with the rest of its own faith, right? So fundamental Christianity is often closer to fundamental Islam or fundamental, you know, any other faith versus almost all world religions have a mystic branch as well. And the mystical stuff is about like, cosmic union with the divine and the world and the mystic branch tends to be closer to the mystic branch of other religions like mystic christianity and mystic buddhism and mystic islam are really close together compared to the rest of their faith systems right and so just recognizing like oh like we have like 
like our ways of conceptualizing what is spiritual is really so culturally contextualized. And as we become less afraid, like fear-based systems where we have to protect against what's different, keep us locked up. But when we become more curious and open and humble, and we can take deep breaths and slow our heart rate and wonder and let our imaginations play, like there's room to play in the world. There are connections to be followed. There is space for us to be alive. Mm. Um, and we don't have to be afraid of what's different than us. We can actually learn from and appreciate <laughs> and celebrate things that are different. So that like I, as someone who is, you know, mostly a mystic but a native speaker of christianity right like i can play and appreciate folks of all faiths who are moving in that direction of openness and compassion Mm -hmm. i love it i love it i want to um pivot back to the uh comment in the group chat that i dropped in from julie reeser julie says for the people who are listening later i want to ask about uh the limits put on your reading as a kid and how that translated into your writing like we weren't allowed to have goosebumps or anything in my in my sanctified house and then julie goes on to say i was steered away from so much and i feel that as a loss yes uh I, I can talk a little bit about it because uh, we have a shared experience. Um, like, oh, I the things that I read, most of the things that I read were either really not just wholesome, but dogmatic in the direction of fundamentalism, or they were wildly inappropriate because I sneaked them at my grandparents' house or someone else's house. So I had like this, I had like this, this, book experience of reading things like gosh i can't even come up with the titles because they would sound so silly you know what i'm saying but they all had like a moral and there was a fundamentalist moral or i was reading like stephen king right there wasn't an in-between like i was either reading i and i personally i think because I had this weird, uh, like the way that we are raised, it was such a weird juxtaposition of, um, like purity culture. Um, plus just a lot of really, uh, dark, I, I am comfortable saying superstition, like a lot of dark superstition surrounding like demonic attachment to things, etc. It actually strongly influenced like what I was drawn to as a kid because I was trying to explain it to myself. I was like, what does this mean? Like, I, I know that I've always been an envelope pusher, like my entire life. I just like to find the edge and I like to push it a little bit. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I don't just want to write something. I want to write something that's just a little bit over the edge of what people are comfortable with and what they've experienced before. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this is how we grow and this is how we, you know, take in new things as a culture and as a people. So like, even as a kid, I was drawn to things that had that vibe. Right. So I would go and like sneaky watch television and I loved watching like Alfred Hitchcock and Rosemary's baby and just like, all the things that I could find that were on the television at my grandparents' house or, you know, if it was terrifying, I was into it. I went, I loved cryptids. I used to sneak into the cryptid section of the library and read every book that I could find on like Someone's ghosts. asking, um, did you uh, like Frank Peretti? That shit was so creepy. I read every Frank Peretti book and here's why. It was creepy and, the, and I would skip the last chapter because that's where the moral was and I wasn't into the moral. I was into the suspense. So I would read it and I, and, and actually reading it and seeing like how extreme he took that belief and like demon like demonic possession and uh, like what allowed dark things or bad, like whatever to happen in your life. Like, you know, the whole, like, don't, don't do a bad thing. It'll take down the hedge of protection around your life. And then you'll get full of demons. <laughs> like, don't. I, I mean, I need to pause for a second. Um, not, not to, not to pull focus, but to just to say that like some days, Ash, yeah. when I think about this, I'm like, ha ha ha. How silly was that? Right. Then other days I get seriously fucking mad right. yes. because, because 
There are 8, 9, 10, and 11, 12-year-olds uh, in our country right now who are scared that their hedge of protection is going to fall because they, because they have a different queer identity. Hey, Dora Oh, Lee. my God. Listen, yeah. I, was, I used to sing in choir in church, right? I'd be singing in choir. I love There's this woman behind me who was like, she's, too, she's much older than me. She had great boobs and i could only think about the boobs the whole time i was sitting there singing and i was like why the hedge the hedge, the hedge. Really, i'm gonna die like oh no so i would just be like god forgive god me for did. the boobs forgive me the, the demons are gonna get me and this is like my fire experience you know just sitting there singing praying the hedge around myself and trying not to think about boobs that Meanwhile, me as the gay boy was like, all we're doing is singing songs about Jesus being my boyfriend and like, come right? inside me, Jesus. My <laughs> Lord! <laughs> Yes. I love it. I love this. I, I'm glad this show, I'm glad this show mm. happens like at around 10 p.m. local because right? it's it's <laughs> really really wild how um how much pressure are in these spaces that are supposed to be healing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So now I want to ask, like, so how, how did you turn your limit? I'm going to ask this question to both of you and you can pick who goes first. How do you see the wildness of your Pentecostal past mm -hmm. and the beauty of your present? And I'm, I'm factoring in coronavirus, you know, that dusty motherfucker and everything too. But we're all sitting in houses. Like you got, you got a dog on your lap that wants to play Daniel. You got a bookshelf that looks just like fucking beautiful behind you, Ash. So we're not completely at the very end of said no. rope, right? No. So what? Yeah. How do you? How? How is that? That pass of of ducking and dodging hedges. How is that connected to actually hedging yourself um, today? Hmm. I have a long answer for that. So if Daniel wants to go first. Sure. Um, yeah. I will say, um, you know, therapy is a great thing in the world. Um, not every form of therapy is great. Not every therapist is great. Find the right one. Shop around. You got to shop around. <laughs> <laughs> you got to. <laughs> but that said, like, like, yeah, like. You know, when you're a kid, your experience of family is the family you're in. Your experience of the world is the world around you. And, like, to open up and move beyond that, like, and expose yourself takes risk, right? But on the other side of that risk, like, you can find freedom. That said, like, we are are deeply connected both to the places that we come from right like i believe very much in a in a spiritual and physical and cosmic connection it's like it's kind of like you know the world spinning around in a in a big ellipsis around the sun right every year and it's like at christmas when you get all sentimental or if you go back and visit relatives and like suddenly you're acting like a teenager again right like it's kind of like there's a scratch in the record um you know we've moved on like we're we're like so many like rings away from that one but when we get to that spot in the universe like the record can scratch and take you back over there right and you got to do some work then to pick the needle up and bring it back to the right ring where you are now and I think that work, right? To he's say a preacher. Like, he's a preacher. He's a preacher. <laughs> Come on. But to say like, oh, so when I engage my family of origin, when I, you know, I, I don't live in the Pentecostal world anymore. Like when I pray, when I worship in faith communities, like I'm not in the Pentecostal world. I'm still friends with a lot of people in the Pentecostal world. I still talk to people in the Pentecostal world. I... I speak that language and I have speak of the angel card responsibility as someone who's done some work and speaks that language to be in dialogue back and forth with folks who are in that world. But I do have to guard myself and say, that's not my home. My home is this place where I am respected and I am loved and I am cared for. 
and I will surround myself with relationships and people who will see me and love me for the person I am and who I'm becoming, not for the image they had of me that I'm disappointing them around. Right. Yeah, Cammy's saying, what a beautiful analogy. Thank you, Daniel. And Julie's saying, I love the idea of moving the needle. Yeah. 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 I love that. So that's my answer. Yeah. It's a good answer. It's a really yeah. good answer. Da Daniel gets to stay. Um, and I'm going to pause before you go in, Ash, to say that, like, um, it is no secret. For those of you who are new to Love City, um, thank you for watching, everybody, by the way, and tuning in for this really cool, like, laid-back conversation amongst friends. Love City is a very real, real space. Um, and we are in a fight right now for the lives of, of, of innumerable Americans who are black and brown. Um, some of them uh, locked up and being brutalized by the police and beyond. And I have made it no secret that the white people in my life are specially curated. They're artisanal, like, like the little... Um, What's the, cho like the chocolates we used to get? Yeah, like, like, like a wonderful <laughs> cheese plate of my favorite white people. And the reason why you get to stay um, and get invited to the cookout, Daniel and Ash. And see, Daniel and I and Ash and I, we kick it in the DMs all the time because this mofo talks about moving the needle. There are times in life where you will get completely off or pulled back into, I think what you were pointing to is mm -hmm. an old groove. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for me, what that looks like, um, not to not to pull focus again, but what that looks like for me is going back into fundamentalism against mm -hmm. myself. So because I because I'm going to choose after this is over to you know heat up the pizza instead of eat the fruit, I can tend to beat myself in up in the same mm -hmm. ways that I was you know beat down in the church and beyond and there's a rigidity that's yeah. in that groove um that you were speaking to and sometimes i think the truth of what of what's real for me is that if i can get myself back if i can move my needle back into the groove of my ch of my choice or of my choosing it's lighter and airier out here mm -hmm. um i mean i yeah. pretty much have to just i mean transitioning out of uh, fundamental Christianity into Buddhism, Buddhism only requires me that I, that I be a basically good person. Not even a good person, the Buddha says. The Buddha just wants to be basically good. <laughs> you know? Um, the, a bar that's so low that everyone can attain it and feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Ash. Uh, take it away with, oh, with your answer. Yeah, That's good. I, I had a friend who used to call what Daniel was describing, the cattle guard effect, because her family lived on a farm. And so like whenever she passed the cattle guard, like it's like a little rump, little, like a little ridged thing that you drive across when you go down the driveway. And so as soon as it went boom, 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 it's like her brain went away. She became a different person. Like she wasn't who she is now. She was like mm -hmm. then her, right? Um, which I can relate to really strongly too. I think that the way that I coped i guess my experience was this like when you when you are asked to <laughs> when you're when you're in a culture that's good with embodiment kind of but the that what you're the body you're asked to embody yeah is gendered differently than your experience of yourself you learn to separate yourself from your body in a really I, and, I, and I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, and I, that could no. be, that could be annoying to people. But this is just a conversation amongst friends in a living room, which yeah. is how I should have started before I started to do the lions and tigers and bears. Can you unpack everything that you're saying right now? Because there yeah. may be people who pass through the podcast or the the, the watching experience later. You're talk being dismembered from your body, being disassociated. Yeah. What did that look like for you, and what does that look like for kids today? So, so what it looked like for me was being asked to play a part all the time, right? Because my spirituality was intrinsically linked to my ability to perform the gender that was expected of me well. Um, and, and then in the Pentecostal upbringing that I experienced, that looked very specific for girls. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it looked like um, submitting. It looked like being cute. It looked like... Um, 
being soft all the time, which is not a bad thing. It's, it's good to be able to be that, but you couldn't be anything but that. Like you had a limited range of tools that you were allowed to reach for or you got your hand slapped. Does that make sense? Like, so to me, like I had, and, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to pretend as if like people, I don't want to pretend as if women do not have a full range of tools available to them. They do. So I was kind of coping with like, unfairness toward women and also just feeling like I was fighting from a perspective that I didn't even feel fully. Does that make sense? I don't know. That's like kind of meta, but that's how I felt like, um, and I, I think that I started pushing back at a pretty young age. I've always spoke from the gut because I have like a, an inability to handle, like if I, if I perceive something is, not just or not right or if it does not make any damn sense like i have a very hard time accepting it if that makes sense um so, it does it does. like you're 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 low on on the bullshit right yeah so i don't know if you enneagram at all but i'm like a enneagram five all day long um and and being able to talk to people openly i think i'm like a seven or something yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm <laughs> like a seven, seven. Yes, you yeah. Are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like my 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 coping mechanism is to wall off. I said, you can have my body. I will behave how you want to in order to keep you from hurting me, but you cannot have my mind. That's not a thing that you get to touch. I I have the sanctity of my own mind. I have the things that I know are true and the things that I believe. But as a result, I became disconnected from my own body, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Like to be able to 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 be able to um, move out of fund fundamentalism into something that felt more real to me, I guess, something that felt more like accessible. And what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, vulnerable, I guess. In, or, in order to be in order to be that and move into that, like I had to I kind of had to deal with the ghost person that I've been dragging around with myself. Um, that was like the performance of me that other people found acceptable, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so like my my big work has been uh, being present in my own body and making my expression of myself match who I am performing in my body, if that makes sense. It does. Being it's like, present. It's like my spirit is coming back into myself, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Has it fully returned or is it still returning even until, like, is it returning even now? I, I think it's going to, I think it will probably be a lifelong process. But the thing that helps me wow. more than anything are people who are able to accept when I'm speaking from the gut and not recoil when, when I'm talking that way and I'm not being perfectly soft or perfectly amiable, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to play, like being able to let down my guard and be playful and uh, not so self-aware all the time because it takes a lot to, it, it takes a lot to project a false self out into the world and keep your real self where you are. You know what I mean? Like you. Sam, have to be I feel like both of you. You say such big, like lofty things because you're thinkers, <laughs> and I know you're with your thoughts all the time. Could you say that one more fucking time, please? Okay. So, so like, if I have a fake version of myself, right, and a real version of myself, I'm having to. Be aware always. Like if you're pretending to be someone else, you know how when you're up on the stage, you're aware of how the audience is receiving you always. And are they receiving me as that character, right? Like you're painfully or maybe just like exquisitely in tune with everyone who's watching you because you're communicating a story to them. Um, but the thing that I didn't learn how to do is can communicate my own story. I learned how to constantly be hyper vigilant of how other people are receiving me because I was communicating a false story that was acceptable to them. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, so dropping that feels like dropping a wall, like, um, like some people have like a death stare, <laughs> right. That they hide behind. And some people I think can hide around like, um, affability and being, uh, like agreeable, um, performing like, uh, 
you know, you meet people who, who femininity comes from their heart, right? It's, Mm -hmm. it's a heart, it's an expression from their heart of who they are. Right. And I think that everybody has some of that in them. We're all whole complex people. Right. Um, but to have to amp it up to 11 for people to be like, Oh yeah, we accept you. You're a good one of what you are. You're, you're a good girl. Right. To be, to have to crank it up to 11 all the time, it's easy to kind of lose yourself or forget how to make those two things connect. Right. Like the person in my mind can also be present in my body and I can express that to other people. That feels, that feels like a turtle without a shell to me now. Does that make sense? Like I got Mm -hmm. used to it. I got really used to it. So I think that my, uh, my holy work is learning how to ground myself in my body and how to be playful, um, how to be vulnerable with the people around me. And sometimes even the people I trust the most, like I practice a lot with the people that I trust the most, but even then that can be, um, it can be a challenge. And I think that that's part of why, uh, like dark, uh, like horror things that, things that kind of uh took me somewhere else fantasy i think they spoke to me so much because they they broke all of those frames they broke all of the daily expectations of like what's real what's expected what's normal life and they turned it all upside down on its head and anything could happen and i think um that open frame place allowed me to like take that piece of myself and put it in that open frame place and just preserve it it's, it was like a, it was like a life raft, if that makes sense, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, um, that's a place where Ash could go and exist as exactly myself or someone else, or in a world where lots of things were possible and you weren't so locked into, you have to be this, or you have to be this role. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's probably why it continues to speak to me because I know that for a lot of young people, it's the same thing for them. It's a place where you can go and you're not so locked into who do your parents expect you to be? Um, who do your teachers expect you to perform? Right? Like, right. Um, and you can go and try on something new. It, it keeps your brain plastic, I think, which is a good thing. You don't get quite so stuck in that groove or that, that record groove where you always mm-hmm. skip back to. Yeah. Well, and one of the things like, so with our childhood, because like, our parents were also like our teachers <laughs> and like our ministers. <laughs> like it was this like that pressure to be like to to not be able to try on something new was really present. And and as I have talked with parents of adolescents these days who are growing up with the technological visibility and connectedness that we didn't have growing up they're experiencing a very similar thing where like Mm. you know without like all the social media and stuff like a kid could go and like be one thing on their sports team and one thing with their like music friends and one thing at school and one thing in their faith community and one thing when they're at grandma's right yeah and like you can try on these different things and see which one fits and which one's you Um, But there's so much pressure on kids with the social media stuff that, like, it has to match across all your platforms because everybody can see you all the time. you got to have a brand. (laughs) And it's all on the internet, and you've got to have a brand immediately from, like, the time you're 10. And it's like, that's a shit ton of pressure, It's just exhausting. It's exhausting at 36. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, for me, like, I think about, like, what does it look like for us to cultivate for ourselves And then to also do this with young folks around like giving some freedom to play and try different things that you're not great at, you know, like to, to have that level of freedom of like, I don't have to be like on brand and trying to get more likes and subscribes every time I step out my door yeah, or every time I open my phone, you know, or since we're all inside right now but (laughs) (laughs) yeah 
I just want to say I'm per, I'm personally, and you can see the, the talking about grooves. You can see the universe clawing all perfectionism out of my hands. Daniel's witnesses with "Won't You Be My Neighbor" on Thursday nights, and even tonight, you know, there's a specific way that I want things to develop and unfold, and the universe clearly wants me to play. The yeah. universe wants me to just yeah. jump on, hit a single button, like one, two. The universe has said both last week and this week, just jump on, hit the button one time, and just play. And yeah. then, but when we're raised in the paradigm that we came through, there's always one more commandment to hit. There's always one more jewel to get in the crown. You know, there's always. Oh my God. <laughs> Right? Uh -huh, yep. uh -huh. And so because you're saving up these little, you know, rubies and the crown that, you know, uh, that will be in some, some far off kingdom one day, um, mm -hmm. you can get so caught up in what it means to actually perform well. Yeah. Because uh, people ask me all the time, like, where, 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 where were some of your first stages? I'm like, First Union Baptist Church. Yeah. I, I learned oh, yeah. how to yeah. be 12 different people. All of them, yes. not me, is what you were saying, Ash, but yep. I learned how to be a bunch of different people and perform and move crowds and move audiences mm. and yes. congregations. You know, all of is that. Is it the spirit or is it a key change? <laughs> is it the Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And most of the time, it's a good key change. Yeah, um, I mean, I, there's yeah, nothing it's wrong a killer with a key good change. key change. Right. But I also get that in some of Celine Dion's music, too. You know, it's yep. not uh -huh. always... Yes. Uh -huh. And I had to take an inventory of all of the music that I was listening to from the church world that was, like, the unworthy trope. Mm. Um, mm. I'm so unworthy, you know, that saved a wretch like me. Like, why do I got to mm -hmm. be a wretch? Yeah, yeah. Like coronavirus is already fucked up enough. You mean I gotta go through coronavirus and I gotta be a wretch that saved a wretch like me? <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna, put, <laughs> I'm gonna put all of that on the side for like mm -hmm. I'm gonna get out of that well, groove, Daniel. So so I think with this talk about play and imagination and religion. I think it would be a great time for me to read one of my favorite passages from Caddy Wampus. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and for those of you who are still here, he's going to read from Caddy Wampus, and then we're going to make like a major announcement at the end of this thing. Um, so um, before you do that, Daniel, that's a perfect yeah. segue. Um, what the fuck is a Caddy Wampus, Ash? Okay, so it's like a word. I, I suspect it's probably like a combination of different words that people stuck together. And it means... It means like crooked, a little sideways, or not straight. And I thought that was kind of why perfect. people can, why people, ladies and gentlemen, why people can do whatever they want. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, oh, I don't want to give anything away. It's not no. a proper name. No. It's oh, it's, it's it's a made-up kind of Stephen Schwartz kind of. It's a it's a hillbilly word. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a hillbilly oh. like. I used people to like States I would be it. sitting yeah, I would be oh, sitting like out in the out in the farm or something and someone one would be like, Look at that look at that thing over there. It's a little bit catty wampus. It's just look at it, it's laying it sideways, it's side goggling. Like <laughs> it's it's crooked. It's not straight. But I liked it because it was a play on words. It was like you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be straight. <laughs> like <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Be yourself. Good. Thank you for that, Ash. I had yeah. no clue. And that's the research that a real interviewer would do before <laughs> they engage someone. <laughs> uh, but we don't that's do good. We play over here. We play I over like here. I like this better. I Take like it that. away. It feels better to me for damn sure. Um, yes. So try not to give too much away, but if you read the dust jacket, you'll get most of what I'm going to tell you here. Um, there are some... Uh, magically resurrected zombie witches, <laughs> and they wait, have made. Wait, 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 wait! I gotta pause you and say that um, the 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 comments went wild in our last little shoot off. Uh, Christopher from What You My Neighbor said, uh, Cammy saying of Christopher, her partner. Um, Christopher sitting here saying, "Yes, the language of my people." <laughs> Nothing about talking nonsense that's exactly what the fuck it was when white people start talking nonsense other white people start going yes the language of my people chris don't let me get started on your ass 
Good to you. Good to you. Good to you. So these resurrected zombie witches, uh, who are two feuding witch families, have wandered their way into a church rummage sale that's being held inside of a church. So we're going to pick up in the midst of this chapter. <laughs> this is perfect this is one of my segue. Favorites. This, this is, is perfect. one of my favorite scenes from the book. The five McGill zombies turned in unison, gazing at Katie. Acid rose in Katie's throat. The nearest one lunged. With a rattling snarl, its bony fingers snatched at Katie, missing her face by a foot as Katie screamed and leaped backward. The zombies gathered around her in a slow half-circle, seeming to savor her predicament. Katie was a mouse, and they were toying with her. She was dizzy with panic. She couldn't fight zombies with snarled-up magic. She glanced around the room for ideas. The zombies inched even closer, hissing, could she distract them? They only cared about defeating the Hearns. That's the other witching family. Maybe Katie could play that against them and buy herself some time. But what might appeal universally to every old person, dead or alive? The, the Hearns are on their way to this rummage sale, Katie blurted, her voice squeaking. And if you don't get the good stuff first, they'll snap up everything here faster than you can blink. Katie shuddered at her word choice. These things didn't have eyes to blink with. They'll, they'll beat you at rummaging. The zombies exchanged dark looks. Katie held her breath, sweat rolling. All at once, the undead witches attacked the rummage tables like a pack of wolves. With a savage rage that made Katie shake, the zombies shattered and shredded as much as they pocketed. One set a pile of socks on fire with her wand, filling the room with smoke. Plates smashed and silverware bounced, clanging across the floor. Trembling, Katie scurried to the edge of the smoky room, grateful she wasn't the one being ripped to tatters. What next? The rummage sale would only keep them occupied for so long before they turned their creepy eye sockets toward the festival outside. What would Delpha do? Delpha's another character in the book. Her eyes landed on the baptismal tank at the far end of the room. The thing was, in essence, a deep bathtub on a raised platform, with walls built around it so little kids wouldn't topple in. The rectangular tank had a clear plexiglass window on the front so people could watch their friends and families be baptized by submersion. More or less, a spiritual dunking booth. The act was meant to symbolize resurrection from death. A wry smile played on Katie's face. It might work as a zombie jail, and there was a certain poetic irony to it. Skirting around the ransacking McGills, Katie stumbled to the baptistry and tried the big metal door. It was unlocked, but the lock mechanism was inside the tank, not outside. She couldn't trap the zombies with the lock like that. Rats! The zombies smashed and ripped their way through another row of tables. Katie crawled to grab one of the fallen butter knives from the floor. When she'd gotten it, she hurried back to the baptistry door. Katie licked her lips in concentration. Once, when Caleb was three, that's her younger brother, he'd accidentally locked himself in the bathroom while her dad was out for milk. Katie had undone the screws holding the doorknob to get Caleb out. Now she planned the same for the baptistry door. She undid the screws with the flat knife, then yanked her half of the doorknob loose. Once that was done, she pushed the other half through, so it fell away in a clatter. Katie used her index finger to open the inside latch, swinging the door open. Then, hands shaking with fear and excitement, she replaced the handle halves backward with the lock on the outside. Katie glanced at the zombies, and her heart slid to her shoes as she realized not every innocent person had escaped the rummage sale. The town's oldest, sweetest citizen, Mrs. Hathaway, who was mostly blind, had been manning the cash box. How had Katie not noticed? Now the tiny lady stood in the middle of the room, mistaking the zombies for actual people. Precious saints, she warbled. Please don't do the dishes that away. She squinted at the zombies through the thick glasses, clutching the money box with gnarled fingers. I'm afraid y'all will have to pay for whatever you break. Oh no, Mrs. Hathaway. But Katie Bird wasn't fast enough. 
The tall McGill zombie's leathery face cracked as a smile split, actually split, its face. With insect-like speed, it raised its wand and landed a hex on Mrs. Hathaway's frail chest before Katie Bird could even scream. It wasn't pretty magic. The old woman moaned as she slowly went gray and rigid from toe to head, like stone. Katie held her breath in horrified silence as Mrs. Hathaway's watery eyes went dull. Timidly, Katie reached with one finger to poke the old woman's arm, then leaped back, shuddering when she felt cool granite. They'd turned Mrs. Hathaway into a tacky lawn ornament. Katie Bird couldn't stop shivering from shock. Mrs. Hathaway was as much a part of the hollow as Sadie's kitchen or Spring Fling or the church itself. She couldn't be dead dead. This couldn't really be happening. A guttural growl from one of the witch zombies assured her it really was. The creatures turned Kate toward Katie. She stumbled back, slipping on ceramic plate shards and slicing her elbow open. Chest tight, she jumped to her feet and screamed with all the ferocity she could muster. The herns are in there, she pointed at the baptistry door. After them! All five zombies erupted with snarls and bloodthirsty squeals, hiking up their skirts and charging the door. Katie Bird followed hot on their heels, praying her plan would work. The first granny zombie screeched to a halt at the doorway, sensing something was fishy. Too late. Her zombie sister slammed into her full throttle from behind, and four of them fell like ugly rag dolls into the baptismal tank. The last granny teetered on the threshold, arms flailing. Katie Bird lifted her purple sneaker and kicked the thing with all her might. The zombie toppled forward, and Katie Bird slammed the door and locked it, breathing hard. The trapped witches snarled and cussed and beat their hands against the walls, trying to escape. One who'd been born in a century without clear plastic headbutted the plexiglass and fell back dazed and confused. A wretched chant arose, kill the herns, kill the herns. The undead witch's crazed faces contorted with a blind hatred that sent cold dread down Katie Bird's spine. Not this hern, you hateful old bats. Katie Bird turned, crestfallen at the statue that had been Mrs. Hathaway. Her eyes welled with tears. What must the poor woman have felt? Without warning, the trapped magic in Katie's hands surged, and the stinging knocked the breath from her. For a few minutes, she knelt on the glass-strewn floor and felt sorry for herself. If only I were like Delpha or Tyler or Mama or Nanny, she thought. If only my magic worked, I might have saved her. But everything was so wrong. Her magic, the zombies, every bit of it was cattywampus, crooked, wrong. Katie wished she could reach out and straighten it all, like a picture frame on the wall. Then, bolting upright, Katie Bird realized she could. Tyler was right. Katie had plenty of power at her disposal. Her mama and her nanny would do anything in the world to help her if she asked them. Her own fear of disappointing her family was the only thing stopping her. She hadn't wanted to fail Delpha either, but those worries seemed so small now compared to what had happened to Mrs. Hathaway. Heart quickening, Katie Bird fished a hair elastic from her pocket and yanked her curls into a ponytail. Folks in the hollow needed protection and she could help them by telling her family the truth. Katie Bird sp sprinted for the outside door, shoes crunching and slipping their way across the wreckage of the rummage sale. She blinked hard in the harsh afternoon sun, then tore across the street toward her family's festival booth. Wow. <laughs> Wasn't it? Okay, so, I mean, you can literally spin anything in thin air. Like, you just turned a half-blind lady watching the cash box um, into... Uh, petrified stone. <laughs> yeah. Why would you do that, Ashvin Otterloo? <laughs> <laughs> um, well... Uh, you got comments here. You got, uh, wow, <laughs> says Matthew Shrank. Amazing. Uh, Julie Reeser loves the puppy sound effects that you're going to hear back in, in the podcast. <laughs> I, I love it. Yes. <laughs> uh, David Kwong Pham says that split our mind. Uh, Kim, Kim Dacus Wilson says zombies and Chuck rummage sales and the baptismal pool. Love it already. <laughs> What made you want to combine all of these things in the way that you did? And then I also, um, personally, 
didn't realize how descriptive you have to be in children's books in order to really make it. Yeah. 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 Um, I think what I really wanted to do was show how, like, a lot of the time, uh, people, especially in small towns, especially people who haven't done a lot of emotional health homework, they have so much baggage in their family, right? And and we bring it all with us, like. And so I was like, let's let's make a story about the living, like actual embodiment of that. What about like everything everything that was wrong with the people who came before us that they didn't fix? They didn't teach us how to fix. Let's let's bring it to life. Let's embody it, right? Let's make it real, right? So now she's actually doing what I think a lot of people end up having to do, like starting at 12 and moving through their teenage years and going into adulthood. Like we, we all have so many things that are chasing us and so many, I guess, demons and zombies, right? That we've been given that we didn't ask for when we were born, but we have them now, right? Like when we, when our spirits came into the world, when our bodies came into the world, like we didn't, that wasn't something that we created necessarily, but it is right it is so it is is. but it is right and so we have to deal with it and i think ultimately we have to deal with uh the way that they affect other people and the innocent people that they hurt and the people that we care about that we would want to protect but if we if we bring these things back to life and if we let them take over our lives um then then we will watch the things that we are handed through us hurt other people right um, wow. specifically, specifically in, in, in my family, you know, um, racism, uh, like, uh, just gen general distrust of anyone who's different, um, unkindness to people who are queer. Um, you know, they, everybody has things that are following them around actively. And I think that, um, unless you learn how to wield your own magic and live in in your own body as yourself right and step into your own power and understand what that means then you do accidentally bring them with you and they do wreak havoc on the people around you you have to do the work right you have to do the work you have and to do the work right and it wasn't necessarily meant to be allegorical but i i think that no matter what you write the story that's in your heart um, and the thing that that you are born to set right with the world, it comes out through your work. So I didn't set out to write a story about like undoing, you know, like uh, classist and racist mindsets that my ancestors handed me, and they feel like generational God. curses, child. Right? Call them what they yes. are: generational, generational curses. curses. <laughs> like, There's that Pentecostalism. I mean, there it is. It comes out. That's the language we have for it, you know? And sometimes it's good language. It's mm-hmm. not always bad. Sometimes it's good. So, like, yeah, I I didn't necessarily set out to talk about that, but I think that whatever's on your heart, it's going to come out through the project that you're writing. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. Um, Daniel, uh, we see very clearly through your reading of this awesome work how Ash – is living out her questions and living through her experience. How are you bringing the manifestation of your journey? You know, Eric mm-hmm. came up through the window <laughs> and dropped you the coolest, uh, you know, <laughs> the coolest words of insight mm-hmm. um, that which forever changed the trajectory of your life. And for those of you who don't know what the fuck Obviously. we're talking about, just Obviously. watch the replay. It um, was going to be a game changer. Okay. Yeah. How did that? How did that bring you to the work that you do? How does that? We, we see how um, these these wonderful metaphor, metaphors and allegories that Ash is talking about. We see how her gifts are coming through in the literature. Yeah, yeah. How is it coming through in, in your day to day? Yeah, I mean, you know, from where where our conversations have been, like this work around. Um, confronting intergenerational white supremacy um, in our own family's roots, right? Like Mm -hmm. dealing as a white person with my ancestors and where those patterns of relating 
and the epigenetic stuff and the intergenerational wealth and all of those things, right, that have been passed mm. down, uh, abuse, alcoholism, yep. Yep. like all these things passed down in our family, right? And for me, doing that work investigating those things but also like having conversations with my ancestors living and dead um and i've never heard a white person talk about talking to their ancestors living and dead until this yeah moment. i mean it's it's so essential and it's such like like because the... why people i'm sorry because I, I, I do this all the time to you daniel but it's because you always make me think why people have ancestors too i yeah. always think of ancestors as like you know simba coming off over the mountain <laughs> You know, uh -huh. and that's very like, you mean, look, I uh -huh. mean, he's black, uh -huh. right? Like, we're yeah, like, yeah. awesome, you know? So I always assume that black people are the only people that have ancestors, but yeah. you have them as, yeah, keep going. Yeah, and, and my ancestors, like those zombies, have a shit ton of baggage, right? Like, and and some ugly they've done in the world. And, and one of the big patterns in our family that I've sought to be confronting in myself is around cutting off from history and being like well that happened then but doesn't yeah. have an implication now right and saying like no no no, we are all connected in this stream right and we've been impacting not only in our own family but the people around us right for since we all crawled out of the sea right mm -hmm. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. so to to me it's doing that level of soul work and then bringing it into the work that I do with people in the day to day, um, helping like you, you spoke earlier about fundamentalism. And I think the, the myth that a lot of folks get who come out of a conservative Christian fundamentalism is that fundamentalism is unique too conservative <laughs> right <laughs> and really you can be fundamental anything yeah. it's that notion of like the concrete rather than elastic and imaginative thinking mm -hmm. it's that um fear-based protect me from what is different versus being curious about what is different and yes. you can be as yes. liberal as they come and be a fundamentalist you can be an atheist fundamentalist you can be like you can be a scientist fundamentalist like that is really about that posture um and how we navigate our willingness to admit that we are at the end of the day, like vulnerable bodies with beating hearts that could stop beating. Right. Like I, there's only so much I can do like to keep my body alive. And like, there's only yeah. so many things I can do to protect myself. Like I can take all the precautions. I can lock my doors. I can eat the right things and take my supplements. And tomorrow, like, the mountain a few miles away from here might blow up because it's an active volcano and I might be dead, right? Like, that's that's just real, you know, because I'm a human. And so, like, I could live in fear around that. I could, like, move somewhere else. I could carry a gun on my person everywhere I go to try to yeah. mitigate the fear that I feel. Or I can say, well, damn it, like, I'm vulnerable. Mm -hmm. How do I love like how yeah. do I how do I move towards with compassion and understanding to bring connection with people who are different rather than being afraid of me like or being afraid of them you know and so I think that's the movement in myself is cultivating that in everything I do and so in my own art like I am a visual artist like I've had to reckon with in the last several years I've developed rheumatoid um, arthritis and it has impacted my hands and like I used to do a lot of like detail work mm -hmm. and I have I've had to change how I create art and move into more like emotive gesture 
work <laughs> rather than fine detail stuff. And my art has gotten better because I've leaned into that risk and that vulnerability. That's and it's scary. Like I get scared that I'm going to like, if I have a really bad few weeks of hand pain, I get scared that my joints are going to get damaged and I'm going to lose the use of my hands, mm. you know, before I'm like 50 or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, but I could just like double down and like try to like control everything or I could just move with it and like care for myself and understand that life is fragile and that's some of the beauty and delight and so I play with what I have in this space and breathe and you know find my flow with whatever comes day to day wow wow Everybody take a breath on that. All of the viewers and our lovely gratitude guests, we're landing the plane. Uh, Julie echoes, well, Julie gives a compliment to, oh, there's lots of compliments here. Um, Jennifer says love. Cammie gives claps to the reading of the book. Julie says, Ash, you have the best verbs. That was excellent. Um, and then Julie gives us our meditation for the night. Before um, we lead into the final like 60 second meditation, I want to announce um, that Love City Arts is partnering with Ash Van Otterloo. Look, Kim and I, um, one of our board members, have been talking about this all week. The fact, and we've been talking about it on the back end. We were the kids that went to the Scholastic motherfucking book fair. Yes. We scraped <laughs> our dollars and our nickels and our dimes, and we went to these little opened, for those of you who are too young, <laughs> these little open bookshelves that came once a year, the Scholastic mm -hmm. Book Fair, to know that Ash Van Otterloo is now one of those authors, like one of my friends, uh, one of my soul siblings, her and Daniel, although Daniel didn't have nothing to do with this book. Um, the Scholastic's <laughs> all Ash. Um, to know that you are, that you put this joy out into the world and that you are a Scholastic uh, Lee published and also a Scholastic author really, really moved me. Um, and I saw the rumblings on the internet and I said, how can Love City Arts actually help? Because Mr. Rogers told us when shit's hitting the fan, look for the helpers. And so what did we do? We said, let's get five of these lovely books. So hold it up right now because this would be where I would get my whole like song and dance. Okay, so now we got we have real. Look at those books. Five copies autographed by this wonderful heart called Ash Van Otterloo are coming your way, uh, courtesy of Love City Arts. We're going to give one a week away, okay? So, yeah, Phil just says, yes, come on, book fair. We're going to – we don't even know what this was. This is the Love City book fair. And it's yes, only, and it's I only love got, it. And it's only got one book. <laughs> You got to start somewhere, baby. <laughs> exactly. Actually, it doesn't, have one, it doesn't have one book. Yep. It has five because between now, if you go to lovecityarts.org um, sometime tonight or if you go now, um, if you click in there on quick links, you're going to see giveaways and there's going to be a picture of the books that they were just holding up. We're going to give one away for the next seven days. Um, Matthew Shrink says we need a grown-up version of the book fair. All right. Well, here we yes. go. And Kim says our um, book fairs were seasonal. What do you mean they were seasonal, Kim? Tell mm -hmm. us what you mean. Um, seasonal as in every fall? Yeah. I, I don't know. So. Okay. There was like a fall and a spring. I think like they had different. Yeah, because I know they come up with different catalogs. They come out with like different seasons of catalogs. So maybe mm -hmm. that's it. I didn't know. Well, for the fall LCA <laughs> book fair, because we're playing, right? And, like, yeah, that's yeah. what I love about it. Like, the whole 20 – I'm going to leave that part up, and then I'll put up an edited version. But the whole 23 first minutes of this, like, last week's first 23 minutes, maybe I'll learn to be simple um, <laughs> in this life, um, was a shit show. Um, but we're playing um in the sandbox together um and it allows authors and theologians and spiritual workers and counselors and creatives to all come together to put good into the world and so this week up until next wednesday we're gonna run uh that raffle uh love city arts dot org slash caddy wampus week one and i'll make sure that this gets um up on in the show notes and on the web week one six days go and try to get that first 
personally autographed book, which will be which will be announced next week, and then we're going to give a book a week away for the next five weeks. Um, into uh, what's the ages of or your target demo? I mean, kids of all ages, but what's your target demo? The target demo is eight to thirteen, but I will say that everyone who's read it has been like, "This is for everyone. It's really okay. for everyone. Maybe not your three year old, but." everyone else yeah, yeah yeah you don't want you don't want your three-year-olds knowing I'd that there is like, a precocious right. six-year-olds be, yeah, yeah. They need to be traumatized like Ash with Stephen King but like <laughs> yeah. it's a petrified old lady that might take the three-year-old over the top so we'll at 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 um for for five years or so so kids yeah. of all ages sign up um there's wonderful opportunities there five books so five opportunities to jump in on um what we just invented david phil matt kim um and all of us together as a love city adult book uh fair what's up and Daniel? i'll say too like email or call your local library and request that they get a copy of it too mm -hmm. thank you yeah, we've seen that Ash has a wonderful way of weaving narrative and also um, bringing a playful, wonderful element to deep and profound. Like we've talked about everything from the like the deep and meaningful to like you know, you know the uh, uh, zombies, you know, <laughs> zombies in the baptistry, in the baptistry, <laughs> right? Um, and so your way of being able to bring all of these parts of ourselves into this playful energy is is what I was attracted to and what compelled um, me and our team. Kim's on the line right now, ran it by her first. We're just going to get these five books from you um, and have your um, light and love and wonderful energy. Ash, I just want to just tell you. I got to complete the thought. I just want to put more of your lovely light into the world. And I want to tell you that from everything that you've told us about what it meant to be a kid like you growing up in a world like this, for you to turn it into something that's cattywampus and beautiful is the reason why we're here. Yeah. yeah. Um, as a celebration. That's what Love City Arts is all about. We celebrate people. So thank you for partnering with us on that. Thank um, you so much. And one of the meditations that came up from one of our viewers as we end here, um, I lost connection to the mouse because I lost connection to everything earlier on. I am vulnerable, Julie says. Mm. How do I love? So for the next two minutes, I just want us to put our feet, if we have them, on the floor. And I want us to just kind of rest in this cattywampus meditation. Um, Daniel's already doing it, so if you feel comfortable um, and not too woo-woo, hands on hearts. I am vulnerable. How do I love? And this, this goes beyond zombies. Maybe your personal zombie tonight is uh, the rent that's coming due at the 1st of October. Maybe there's some instability around your children returning to school. Maybe there's some instability around why you keep buying the Doritos. I have a huge vulnerability around the Doritos right now. And I'm vulnerable but how do I love? And so I want to invite all of the listeners um, and the viewers from this week. This is really the reason why. I mean, I got a really, really expensive microphone hanging out here, but the reason why we're here is not for expensive soundtracks and microphones. We're here to come deeper into the space of intense vulnerability right now. It's a Wednesday night kind of vulnerability. I don't know where my next paycheck is coming from. And if the government decides that they don't want to drop decades, I am vulnerable. And if everything that I own falls away from me, I am vulnerable. If I lose every follower and every friend, if I never sell another book, if I never have another client, if no one ever listens to me express in this life, I am vulnerable. How do I love? And 
And so that's the open-ended question. We never leave our viewers or our listeners or our friends or our neighbors or our community members empty-handed. The open-ended question until we cross paths again is how to be vulnerable and still find the love in it. Mm. How to be vulnerable and to find a groove of love within ourselves. And so if you've not breathed today, I want to invite you to just take a really, really large breath, like a big gulp, 7-Eleven kind of breath. And just be mindful of your breathing. I am vulnerable. How do I love? I could not have written that down on a note card to share tonight if I wanted to, Daniel. That is a magic that's very specific to the 10 plus three people who are sharing in energy right now. I don't want, I'm going to let us go, but I don't want to let it go. This cattywampus-like magic that is just in and around everything and is as accessible to us. Even even that person, even, even, even Justin with Dora Lee, part of the magic. Breathe on it. Daniel knows this. Um, I should tell you that Thursday nights we do this awesome program called Won't You Be My Neighbor at 8 o'clock where we bring all of our black mama and white mama issues into a room. And for an hour and a half, we actually do the work of healing ourselves and each other in community. Check that out. Passion Pachacucha is coming. The people may sue me for the name. Um, because they think that something's really special about uh, 20 slides for 20 seconds over six minutes and 40 seconds. I'm not sure if I'm stealing their idea or if I just want to do it. Either way, it's coming. It could be called Betcha Bucha because I'm black and I'm petty. <laughs> but that's coming. On the 25th of this month, it's going to be another People's Cabaret. We're just meeting strangers and pushing play on live streams and creating community. If that's what you're into, healing the black mama, white mama issues of life, singing the songs of your heart, presenting the passions of your heart, and sitting down in cattywampus energy weekly um, in the good report with friends like what we just experienced. Love City Arts is available to you. Moving beyond needing to be everything to all people and just the 10 plus three that we've had tonight. Julie says, this is beautiful. Thank you all for doing this and sharing. David Kwong Pham says, you all know how to nail us in the heart with book fairs. Phil says he remembers the catalog. And then Matthew says it's necessary. Um, my original thought was that Daniel knows I always give the last piece of chicken on the table. It's a Southern thing to do. I always give the last piece of chicken to the people that I speak with. And so I'll start with Daniel and then we'll end with Ash. What are your last, first of all, answer this question. What piece of the meat is the chicken that you're reaching for as the last? And then what is your actual last piece of chicken thought, Daniel? And then Ash. Uh, you're muted because of the baby. Sorry. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> For me, it should definitely be a smoked chicken thigh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, best piece of meat on the bird. Come so. on. Come on, smoked thighs. <laughs> People and chicken. Hey. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all. Just. Mm, mm. Life is just too damn short to be stuck being afraid, and it will take everything in you but leap towards love. That's what I got. I 
I I would give my left ear for a decent piece of southern fried chicken drumstick. I could eat 12. I really could. I, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I miss southern chicken. I'm surrounded by amazing food, but I miss it. Um, giving, giving up all the little defensive thoughts that spring up that cause you to feel critical of someone else or take the easy road of blaming something or attributing something to someone because of a label that they carry because you feel insecure is doing you such an inser- disservice because you cannot be present with yourself until you learn to be uncomfortable and to feel vulnerable. So like do that little kid thing of standing in the very center of the teeter totter and trying to keep your balance, no matter how many times you fall off, it's a good place to be because that's where you're alive, right? Holding, holding the tension for knowing that you are vulnerable, that you're not invulnerable and seeing other people with compassion means seeing your own ability to die (laughs) and your own ability to, to hurt, but also experience joy and experience Mm -hmm. like fantastic pleasure in the, in real time, in your body, in the moment, being, being on that center of the teeter totter is the place you want to be, even though, even though it's terrifying, right? Because that's Mm -hmm. where, that's where you get to feel like yourself. So do that, do that thing, no matter how many times you fall off. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. All the love. I think y'all are wonderful. Um, Check out Ash Van Otterloo's book, Caddy Wampus. Also, catch uh, check out Daniel's amazing life force if you want to see him really throw down his knowledge for the for, in the service of good. Come to a won't you be my neighbor? You won't be disappointed. We always get nuggets uh, like I'm vulnerable. How do I love? Like it's like a normal thing um, on Thursdays for us. Everybody breathe. I'm gonna let the. Um, the viewers go now so I can just give private hugs to Ash and Daniel. Um, But I hope that you all have a really, really awesome week. Um, Next week, I think Jerrica is on next week, but stay tuned. Um, It'll always be when I, when I get my shit together and and (laughs) I'm teeter tottering too. When I get my shit together, it's just going to be push play and just be. And I love that we've got to experience what it feels like to r- wrestle with yourself and then what it feels like to be on the opposite end of of what it means to like not wrestle at all and just be with friends. Have a good night everybody. We love you. <laughs>